Hello and welcome to A Review to a Kill, the James Bond retrospective podcast where we rewatch every Bond from Connery to Craig to review and rank each one. I'm your host, Special Agent Sedgwick, and returning for this debrief is an agent that always checks his corners. Carter. Chris Carter. Today, we are reviewing On Her Majesty's Secret Service, the sixth Bond outing from Eon Productions. The film premiered on the 18th of December, 1969, at the Odeon Leicester Square in London, with the square setting up new speakers just for the movie's avalanche scene. It again premiered the following day in the United States. Broccoli Saltzman are on the cutting edge. If they could do it realistically, they were going to do it. If they could shake the audience, they're going to shake the audience. They quickly went from Roger Corman-esque to finger in the pulse, that's true. Yes, they did. They scaled back the budget a bit. Broccoli and the director wanted to ground Bond a little bit after You Only Live Twice and save a little money since You Only Live Twice didn't perform as well as Thunderball. Made for $7 million, this movie only made $82 million in the box office. Oh, they grounded him. This movie was seen as a critical flop at the time, though its reception has grown considerably in later years to almost cult film status. I attribute the cult status to there only being one dude to ever do this movie. That's a big part of it. It's a novelty. That's a big part of it, yeah. Produced by Broccoli Head and Salty Man. <laughs> starring George Lazenby, a young, handsome, cocksure model with no acting experience and an ego bigger than Bond's. It's his only film. But he was nommed for a Golden Globe that he didn't win. No, but it was nommed. Oh yeah, and I got this. What a pittance. <laughs> Saltzman had wanted to adapt The Man with the Golden Gun in Cambodia and use Roger Moore as the next Bond already, but political instability meant the location was ruled out and Moore instead signed on for another series of The Saint. Back in the day, The Saint was the shit. Do you remember that Saint movie they made in the 90s with Val Kilmer? I do, I love that movie. You're the only one. The dots roll out and pause center frame to highlight the Brock and Salt connection before continuing the film. The Bond theme sounds high-pitched and odd. It reminds me of Joe Dante's themes from Gremlins almost. Huh. I don't know if they necessarily got it right with this mm. theme song. This is also, I don't know if you noticed, but this is the first time that you've seen the production credits over the, the dots since Dr. No. That's interesting. Lazenby's Bond walks out, fedora adorned, for the first and last time. He walks into frame and look close. They hold him for a second in one spot at the edge, but he's still walking. So for a moment, he's walking in place. For a moment, it does look like he's on a treadmill or something. He spins gracefully, arms out, almost like a ballerina, and goes down to fire on one knee. It's a foreshadow. Almost like a ballerina. The blood looks more fake than ever and actually covers the blonde plate completely. When he did it, I was like, this is why we don't hire dancers. His arm was a lazy flop with a jazz hand attached. It looked like his arm was dead. So when he spun around, it just flopped over. It went all the way behind his back. Yeah, it was a little weird. I still like it a little bit better than the hop. Seriously, though, most annoying version of the Bond theme ever. I like synth sounds. So for me, it's not the most annoying version of a Bond theme. But you're fired from the show, by the way. The dot opens on a shiny plaque for Universal Exports. Hey, there's a man in the reflection. And that's our director, M. Night Shyamalaning himself in there. Huh? Very cool. M. Night, shame on you, Peter Hunt. Hard cut to M, lighting a pipe in his office as Q bends his ear. Well, I've been saying for years, sir, special equipment is obsolete, and now computer analysis reveals an entirely new approach. Miniaturization. For instance, radioactive pocket lint. Placed on an opponent, the location fix seems fairly obvious. Q rambles as M looks on, wondering if he's gone mad. <laughs> well, to M's defense there, he is just holding up a bit of fuzz. It's <laughs> <laughs> radioactive <laughs> bucket lint. <laughs> just a bit of fuzz. I mean, it, like, it doesn't look like much else, but, you know. The prop department was lazy. <laughs> Yes, and the prop department was fucking lazy. <laughs> Here's some lint. <laughs> I wonder how it's long it to scratch that up. The presentation being well and good and all, M is looking for 007, not an opponent. Number 10 is making ugly noises about Operation Bedlam. What the fuck is the point of the lint thing? 
I, I don't know what the point of the lint thing. And is this the first mention of number 10? Who the fuck is number 10? I have no idea. I think he meant like, you can't say 0010, so they just say number 10. That kind of makes sense, I suppose. I don't know. Fuck off. M asked Moneypenny if anyone has reported on Bond's whereabouts, to which none have. M says the PM wants to be personally informed when they find him. Odd, but okay. How is it that everybody knows this dude is a spy, everybody has his itinerary, but the people he works for could never find him? Just well, because he actually is a good spy, but the only people he actually hides from and lies to are the people he works for. He's technically a double agent. Apparently. Cut to Portugal as a much better and more contemporary Bond theme blasts for five seconds. A 1968 Aston Martin DBS tears through the streets. Two different model DBSs were lent by Aston for this film. One for the studio scenes and one for the exterior shots. No one will ever notice that those were two different models. But it's a beautiful car. I'm not going to pretend it's my favorite Aston, but I would probably drive that car over... Oh, uh, yeah. Bond continues down the A5 from the Lisbon area toward Guincho Beach. This is a beautiful mountain coastal road, but the view is quickly interrupted by a fire engine red 1969 Mercury Cougar RX-7 roaring up behind Bond and incessantly honking her horn. It's Tilly Soames all over again. She passes, and this time he doesn't steady on. He revs up and gives chase, taking both hands off the wheel to light a cigarette. The Bond theme shrieks again, but again, it's back to the John Carpenter version. <laughs> I like that, the John Carpenter version. <laughs> as they try to make Bond look as cool as possible while holding off the meta face reveal of the new actor. At the beach, he pulls up next to her parked car and pops his glove compartment, which is a secret cubby for a sniper rifle kit. He grabs the scope and uses it to scope the chick that he's following for literally no reason. Literally only because she raced past him. Watch me with a scope while I go do my business because I drove past you, fucking weirdo. Right? I have news for you. This is how he acts as Bond for the whole movie. A little bit weird. Weird and rapey. So they shot the scene, then superimposed a crosshair as if we're looking through a scope. But we can see outside of the circle, and it's the same magnification. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's like they put a transparent crosshair just over... Just over the lens. <laughs> Here's a sticker. We don't know how to shoot through a scope. Although we've done it before, but we don't know how it works. We shot through a barrel, but we're not going to shoot through a scope. We see the woman's face. It's Diana Rigg from the Avengers. No, not Marvel one. And not the 90s one either. You may know her best, depending on your age, as the baddest ass in Westeros, Olena Tyrell. You kids probably know her from Game of Thrones. I know her from The Avengers, which was just as dope a show as The Saint. Probably a little bit doper, because there was way more action. Mrs. Peel, ass kicking in a tight black bodysuit. My god, man. She takes off her shoes and goes for a dip in the ocean, and this creeper stalker flips out and speeds down the beach like a demon. She's knee-deep in water, and he runs out like David Hasselhoff without the slow-mo. <laughs> My whole thing was jump to many conclusions. It's like, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? Why did you go chase this woman down? In the context of the film, she actually is, like, depressed and walking into the ocean. But you as a viewer have no reason to understand or believe that. It just looks like she's wetting her feet in the ocean and this guy is freaking out, goes out, kidnaps her, drags her back to the land. Yeah, yeah. It's really weird because, like, there is no setup for her apparent suicide attempt. It's just this chick walking into the beach. It doesn't even look like a suicide attempt. This movie gives you no setup for that at all. At all. She doesn't even look depressed. He grabs her. She says no, she struggles, and he picks her up and forcibly carries her away, which is abduction. He drops her off on the beach and helps her regain consciousness, which I guess she lost going into shock from being kidnapped. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. It's like, why did she faint? And she just, he grabbed her and she just passes out. That's a hell of a defense mechanism. I, I know a lot of animals that do that. You know, you poke them, they just pass the fuck out. <laughs> Goats. She's a goat. <laughs> Stiffens right up. Ugh. As soon as her eyes open, he's like, Morning, my name's Bond, James Bond. Don't move, a man says, holding a gun behind Bond. There's two men. One takes the woman away, and the other makes Bond lie down on a boat. 
This is Raphael, played by Terrence Mountain. He goes to shoot Bond, but Bond kicks the gun away in a wonky edit, then hits Raph with an anchor, sending him somehow 30 feet from the boat, causing Bond to sprint after him to fight him again. Oh, and we get the final full reveal of George Lazenby's face when he says, hello there. Uh, but in this very first fight scene, I immediately miss Toho Studio. Just immediately. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't blame the fight choreographer or the actors. I blame the editor because apparently the editor has no fucking idea how to edit anything, let alone a fight scene. Oh, oh. Bob Simmons is not back, and you can tell that this is not his <laughs> fight style. It's fast and loose. It's over-exaggerated to the point of cartoonishness with how wild and extended these punches are thrown. The stylized editing, to be generous, <laughs> stylized, does not help this Looney Tunes-esque feeling. I know I was complaining about Bob's slow, stiff, uninspired fight coordination, but this is the extreme in the opposite direction completely extreme in the opposite direction. You have no idea what the fuck is going on half the time with these jump cuts. I don't understand how they could go from what they just did in Japan <laughs> to this. To this. The man holding the woman sees his partner getting waterboarded by Bond and drops the woman. Bond traps Raf under a boat and the other guy in a net that's just barely folded over him. All of a sudden, the bitch nicks his Aston. Just for a moment, she drives it up the beach to her car and cheeses it the fuck out of there, leaving Bond to stare directly into the camera and say to the audience, This never happened to the other fella. This fourth wall breaking moment is one of my most hated Bond moments ever. People were like, well, he was just being rhetorical, right? And like, I forget, I think Peter Hunt was the one who said, no, no, that was straight at the camera. That was for the audience. It is one of those weird... Things that some 60s movies decided to do that think, make them think that they were funny. Peter Hunt thought that shit was funny. Tonally, it doesn't work in this movie because this movie is not a fucking comedy. It doesn't work in a Bond film. And it's not an action comedy. There's no, there's no real other chuckle moments in this movie. It's a Bond film, not Deadpool. Right. Also... Guy, maybe this never happened to the other fellow because you ain't Sean Connery, buddy, even though your ego was somehow bigger. Yeah, George Lazenby famously had a... Serious ego problem. Lawrence Olivier ego. The music strikes up, and it's got that same odd 60s pre-synth vibe to it, though not as grating. The imagery of the titles are composited so smoothly and more skillfully this time, with striking imagery that gives way to a recap of the Bond series so far for the rest of the titles. This and many references to past Bond films, i.e. the fourth wall break, were to connect the new Bond to the old one and to say, this is the same guy, and that's directly from the directors and the producers. That was their intention, not another bloke using the name as a code word. I'm just saying, this is something that they'd cement with Craig and his parents' grave with the surname of Bond. Get over it, it's done, theory dead. It's only a true Bond opening for like five seconds and then the imagery goes away and it's just a recap. Yeah, and it's just a recap of characters that, you know, you will barely remember if you actually saw these in movie theaters. He did everything he could to just be like, this is the same guy, I swear. This was ridiculous. I didn't like it. Connery kept his word and bowed out. They ended up with a guy who'd never been in a picture before, though as we'll soon discuss, his ego was immediate and larger than anyone else's in the world. There's many reasons this bloke only has one Bond film, but... Knowing of his inexperience, they hired classical actress and the hottest thing to ever live, Deanna Rigg, to balance that. In her words, prop him up and bring some gravitas. They famously did not get along. But that's what happens when you hire Peter Sellers Part 2. <laughs> right. John Leach is back, but promoted to Bob Simmons's job, credited as stunt arranger. John Jordan, our footless aerial photographer, is back for the last time before his tragic demise in his next project. Peter Lamont, again, set to core. Stock car sequence director, Anthony Squire. Eileen Warwick has been making a name for herself on these films as hairdresser, so I'm going to throw her name in there now since she's been doing so many. You get it, girl. Come get your hair did. Funny name this time, Jackie Cummins, wardrobe mistress. <laughs> okay. Yeah, sure. Filmed again in Panavision and in Technicolor. Titles by the man, Maurice Binder. 
John steers back on special effects. John Glenn, no, not the astronaut, is our new editor and also already second unit director. Get used to this name. Yeah, is he, he going to be moving on to be the guy, huh? Oh, for a long time. Director of Photography, Michael Reed, who the director brought over with him after working together on Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Production designed by Sid Kane? Only from Russia with Love till now. Didn't have Ken Adam. And that film had Sid Kane, his protege. We may be in for some large, ornate, empty rooms. Music by John Barry. We have all the time in the world. Song by Louis Armstrong. Yeah, that was nice. Additional dialogue, Raven Simone, sorry, Simon Raven, mm-hmm. but screenplay penned by returning Richard Maybaum after being absent for the last film. The Brock and Salt connection gave themselves the treatment this time. Six naked women, nipples showing, but they share the treatment with our new director, a promoted Peter Hunt. That's why we have a new editor and why I was so secretive. Uh, I was just saying the director earlier. He finally got the job. And they'll never ask him to do it again. Well, it was it all his fault? As I alluded to, the titles are probably Maurice at his most skillful, just not his most creative, because I do disagree with you. I felt like the skills here were on point. Yeah. How I was watching the way he was executing these titles compared to the way he's done things before. Mm -hmm. This man is surpassing himself in how he's executing these things. But he's getting so creatively bankrupt that they're just becoming just slideshows. Which, once again, you could probably say had more to do with the director's ambition. And he is an ambitious little fuck. He flew all the way to Japan. But the titles do open the film with an almost curtain-like effect. That was pretty cool. Bond pulls into the Hotel Estorio Palacio, right next to the Red Cougar. Nice name, by the way. Mm. He walks in, and the concierge greets him by name and rank. Punch shakes his hand and greets him as Manuel. Manuel, played by Brian Worth, snaps the porters to service mode. Yeah, this is a great hotel, and it seems like Bond's been here lots. <laughs> this is the first time that we see Bond is so high class that this happens. But it was, again, honestly, just a cheap, easy way to show the audience that this is the same guy, having random people recognize him. But the implication really is, again, that his hotel and travel itinerary has been so well known for so long that NPCs know who he is when he shows up now. Right. Everybody knows this dude is a spy. While shooting the shit with Manuel, Bond asks about the cougar, and Manuel tells him it belongs to Contessa Tracy de Vicenza. Manuel shows Bond his room. Their best. Fortunately, they'd had a cancellation. Yeah, it's Sid Kane, all right. The room is larger than Ken would have made it, but not as large as Sid would have last time either. Right. So it works as a suite. The ornate decor actually fills the not-as-cavernous set. So far, these are done nicely. Yeah, I didn't really have any issues with the sets at all. I mean, they weren't overdone, and they weren't underdone. I was surprised. Yeah, he got better. Yeah. It was way toned down. Yeah. I wouldn't have guessed Sid. It's still his style. They're still big, but he knows how to make them look right now, and they are toned down. Mm Mm-hmm. Bond says, yes, this will do nicely. Looking down over the pool, transition to a night shot of the pool, like the transition from the last movie. So they did learn some stuff overseas. They did learn some stuff. The problem with this shot is the reflection of the word casino in the pool. It's now composited in and it ripples, but the water they filmed this on was a small puddle and not a big pool. And the ripples are huge and fast and it does not look right at all. (laughs) It doesn't look right at all. Hard cut to what the fuck is this? Offensive statues and purple wallpaper? Is this Casino Royale 67? It kind of looked like it, didn't it? Dude, what the fuck is up with these blackface statues, man? And this seriously gaudy wallpaper? I don't feel comfortable in this casino. (laughs) What the fuck are we doing in here, man? It's a little weird. It's a little weird. Definitely colonial English. I'm surprised not all the servants were black. Dressed like barbarians. Yeah. Wow, though. This casino set is honestly huge, but not in a volcano layer big way. But it's up there and partitioned with walls. And it doesn't feel like you're in a big empty room that they put up fake walls. It feels like you're in a casino. A fucking weird one, but a casino. Too true. 
Bond sits at a baccarat table and lights a smoke. I hate this tux. Nice frills, asshole. I thought he looked alright. He looked like he was late for his prom. <laughs> the pot gets heavy, and no one will match Bond until a mystery woman comes that's totally not obviously Tracy with her head slightly behind a light. <laughs> She's in a dress that shows more than it hides, and she bends over for the cards whilst Bond and every other man stare. Totally checking her out. Bond wins, and she can't pay. Bond swoops in and says, no, nah, it's cool, she's with me and doesn't have to pay me. She runs to a table in the Crown Royale diner, and Bond sits next to her, ordering a Dom Perignon 57. That, like, what the hell was that saying, too? Like, how do you place a Baccarat bet with no money? What the fuck is going through your brain right then? And also, that's not how that works. She can't no. just lose a bet to you and you're like, nah, just cancel it. None of that made sense to me. If I was a casino, that would immediately make me think you guys were cheating partners and something weird just happened. Right. Why must you save me, Mr. Bond? It's becoming a bit of a habit, isn't it? That doesn't answer her question, bro. Mm, it's very stalkery. Just say it. Every time he sees this chick, he's got to interfere in her life in some kind of way. Fucking, he's got power issues, man. Right? She invites him to come later. He <laughs> he, her words. He sends the bottle to her suite with some caviar. Bond goes to her suite and is jumped by a goon named Chi Chi, played by Irvin Allen, who will be in The Spy Who Loved Me as well, but as someone else. They have a fight. The choreography is loose and quick, as I said before, but John Glenn kept the feel of hyper-editing for action scenes. And I don't know why. <laughs> it's not as bad, though. Honestly, the hyper-editing is toned down, but the bad thing that he added is just absolutely intolerable is his jump cuts. I noticed it in the first fight also, but it, it just kind of made me go, like, what was that? Was that a bad cut in the fight choreography? Right. They'll be in one position, and it'll cut to them in a completely different position, fucking constantly in this movie. Yeah, it's like you're missing parts of the fight or something. They're just cutting out three of every five seconds of the fight, and we get quick glimpses and have to fill in the fucking gaps. Yeah. Like I said, I don't blame the fight choreographers or the actors. I blame the editor because... It's bad. I kind of do, honestly, because it's not, you can't just blame it completely for that because the director and the fight choreographer honestly have to shoot it in such a way that, I mean, we've talked about this. When you're doing a fight scene, the worst thing you can do is have a cut. Right in the middle of the fight scene. Basically, people are in different positions from the cut before in the fight scene because it instantly takes people's brains out of the fluidity of the fight. What happened here was a travesty. And it's everyone's fault, honestly, because they all should have worked together to make sure that didn't happen. Bond knocks Chi-Chi out and drops two one-liners, Gate Crasher, and I'll leave you to tidy up. They didn't make my one-liner list. Nope. Well, I mean, if you didn't like that one, don't worry, he'll throw out a hundred more. Then they do the grape scene again, but actually better. After having rendered his foe unconscious, he straightens up and calmly walks out but pauses to slap some caviar on a cracker. Because, fuck yeah, I paid for it. And the guy's unconscious this time. And, and he's a caviar expert, so, you know. He info brags to no one on his way out into the hall, saying, Beluga, north of the Caspian, for literally no reason. For literally no reason. <laughs> Who is he talking to? He's Nobody. just got to info brag. He's bragging to us, because he knows. <laughs> he's bragging to us. Again, fourth wall break. Mm -hmm. Secret fourth wall break. Back in his room, he takes off his holster and starts to unwind as Tracy steals his gun and holds it on him. She's in her underwear and a robe, and he snatches the gun, twisting her wrist. You're hurting me. I thought that was the idea tonight. He says, asking about the man in her room. She says she doesn't know, and he slaps her, threatening more. She says she's not a liar. This has already gotten to arrest levels in today's relationships. Oh, easily. And I, I wouldn't call that a slap. I'm kind of decked her. But they'll be married soon. Shit, spoiler. Weird. Again. I bring it up because so many people today, especially after No Time to Die, were like, Madison's one, uh, Tracy's the best, Tracy's the best girl, she's better than Vesper Lind for his love, and. Honestly, go watch this fucking movie again with a microscope. They have no reason to love each other. They should fucking hate each other. If I treated a woman the first day I met her the way he just did these things, she would call the cops. She would never talk to me again. 
We would yeah. not be married. Yeah, right. That's true. She feels as if he's bought her with that bailout and bangs him to pay for her debt. Her character is suicidally depressed, apparently. When he wakes up, she's gone and checked out of the hotel. Even after sleeping with him, he finds the amount owed in the drawer that he had his gun in the night before, though his gun has again been taken. What happened to Under the Pillow, James? Secure your fucking firearm. That's all that boils down to. Every professional knows this. You don't want your gun to be missing in the morning when you're sleeping with strange women. Secure that shit. I keep my gun up my ass. It's a Walther PPK. It's not that hard. <laughs> I'm sorry. I guess that's why they call it a girl's gun. You know, <laughs> baby. Bond goes to leave the hotel eyeing a girl's ass when he runs into two goons. He seriously, like, stops to double take this girl's ass and he runs into these two goons. The two goons are Clef and Toisson, played by Taki Samuel and Jeffrey Cheshire, respectively. They put him in his own car with Chi Chi in the back, who puts a knife to Bond, who won't shut the fuck up with the smart ass wisecracks. They're not cool, they're not funny, and they don't stop. <laughs> it's worth mentioning that Chi Chi took his gun while he was asleep, and that's what they've actually kidnapped him with his own Walther PPK. Secure your fucking gun, mate. Secure your gun, mate. <laughs> this is bad. This is unforgivable. Bad spycraft. You can't lose your gun. That's like I close up the restaurant at night and I leave the lights on and the door wide open and go home. I'm not going to have my job in the morning. Check your corner. Secure your gun. Fucking Christ. And stop telling people your itinerary. <laughs> As they lead him, they pass a midget whistling Goldfinger. I don't know if you noticed that. Yeah, I did kind of notice that. And Bond tries to swing a half door really hard into one of the dude's legs, but he just puts his hand out like, stop that. He's so petulant. At a door, Bond flips out and kicks people and punches them off their feet while the sound effects go crazy. This editing is kind of nuts and not in a good way. No, not in a good way. It's a better style overall than Hunt's, but it just needs to be toned way the fuck down. See, that's the thing I don't get. It's not. It's not awful, right? It's just way too much. Yeah. Uh, you see that the style will be an improvement when it's calmed down. But between the jump cuts, stylized fighting, and over-the-top sound effects, I just get lost in these fights, and not in a good way, and my head starts to hurt, trying to decipher them in a digestible way. Yeah, they are jarring a little bit. Suffice to say, even though he's acting like a punk kid, and a creepo, more than a spy, and even though I don't know how, he wins. <laughs> Of course he wins, it's James Bond. So he takes the knife and goes in the door they wanted him to go in anyway, but locks them out. In the room, he sees a man and a woman sitting and playing chess. And the man says, hey, don't kill me, let's talk. And Bond throws the knife at a calendar, hitting the 14th. But it's the 13th. I'm superstitious. No, you're bloody not. And the one time Connery said that was a joke about setting her up because he didn't fully trust her with his plans to steal the lector. One of the many callbacks Peter Hunt was doing, but he forgot the point of that. The man here is Tracy's father, actually. Mark Ange Draco, played by Gabriel Fersetti, head of a powerful European crime organization, which is called Union Corps, or the Union Corps. Euro Teamsters, essentially. He is dubbed by David de Kaiser. Oh, he's dubbed? Very well this time, though. Very well, yeah. I didn't notice he was dubbed. He was super suave. I like Draco. I love Draco. I do. He's kind of a caveman, but whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Draco reveals that Tracy is his daughter with an Anglo woman, and he had her schooled in Switzerland, which explains a lot, like A, her accent, and B, like, just a lot more in the future. Yes. He tells Bond of her troubled past, offering Bond one million pounds in gold if he will marry her. Bond refuses a million dollars for his bachelorhood, because he's never heard of divorce. <laughs> He does, and this was Exposition City for Tracy, apparently. This whole scene was just, yeah, my daughter, all about my daughter. Please, please marry my daughter. It's like, Draco is so pissed off, he's going to ask a strange dude to dominate his daughter. In his words, he needs a man to dominate her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For a million pounds. Not a strange dude, he's specifically going after a prolific womanizer. Yes. So he will dominate her. Break her, essentially. Like a pony. Jump on and... Am I right, Peter? But Bond does agree to continue dicking her, 
at least if Draco helps him track down Ernst Stavro Blofeld, who apparently did not kill himself for the price of failure. And apparently that nobody knows how to find him except other criminals. Right. Makes sense. It's just fair. Like it. It's fair. fair. What doesn't make sense is you wanting to set this dude up to assassinate your competition so he can marry your daughter. I just, the whole Draco thing kind of bothers me. Bond is beyond redeemably rapey and creepy in this. It is. The whole film is very mad mini. It's, this is so problematic, honestly. Hard cut to Moneypenny's office, and the hat toss is seamlessly tracked. James, where have you been? Much too far from you, darling. Silly old James, she says as he squeezes her ass. Yeah, we're back to uh, Thirsty Money Penny again, too. I don't know if it was Thirsty Money Penny so much as it was just incredibly rapey Bond. She's like, hey, how are you? I missed you. He's like, ah, oh, I missed you. And then he just like, hand firm on ass, slow, firm, hard, squeeze. Like, kind of like that, you know, purposeful ass squeeze. It was like, like we've been fucking for a while, ass squeeze. It was a little weird, yeah. Bond offers drinks and she sends him in. M is removing 007 from Operation Bedlam. It's been two years and he hasn't gotten Blofeld yet. So that license to kill is going to waste. Bond protests, and M says, that's all. And Bond leaves. No mission, no dossier. So what the fuck was the point of all that? To piss him off? Take him off when a new mission is ready to dole out. That was a quick meeting. Take a memo, Miss Moneypenny. Sir, take this job and shove it. Bond calls M a monument, slamming the door on his way out. Did you know that Bond had an office? Holy shit. I did not. This is the first time and the only time we've ever seen Bond's office. Because he has an office, and he goes to clear it out. Because <laughs> when Bond quits, I guess he goes to clear out his desk. That has five chairs. I was like, his office has nothing in it, and too many chairs. Why does he have an office? It doesn't make sense. How many people does he have in his office? I have no idea, man. So Bond does clear out his desk, pulling out such gems as Honey's Bikini Belt. How did you get that? Didn't that get blowed up? Creep factor 10 now. He pulls out Red Grant's Garou watch, and I know he didn't grab that before bailing off the train. The rebreather from Thunderball. These items are accompanied by their appropriate thematic cues as well. Good on you, John Barry. This is the only callback scene this movie needed. It still didn't work. It's still ridiculous. Other than the rebreather, he shouldn't even have those things. It's either, how did you get that? Or, holy shit, why do you have that, you fucking creep? Hmm. <laughs> this is that reminder for the audience again. Kind of blunt, ain't it? Just like I'm being this entire review in honor of this film. Still in his office reminiscing, his phone buzzes. Double O, uh, James Bond here. See, not a code, just a name. He wants you in his office. Bond goes back into the office, and it should be noted that the whole time, M cannot be bothered to even look the fuck up at him. Request granted, he says. Bond grinds his teeth in betrayal, even though M is really giving him exactly what he wants without it having to be reported and accounted for, which is a tactic M will use a lot with Bond. His favorite tactic, in fact, to use with Bond. Request granted, Bond sours to money penny outside. But what did you expect, a knighthood? Well, the other fella is Sir Sean Connery now, so yeah. <laughs> That's funny. I don't think he was Sir Sean Connery yet, but Fuck yeah. off. That's not as funny. <laughs> Bond looks down and sees the request was for two weeks' leave. Money Penny blushes. She sent in a leave request, not a resignation. But M knows what's up. Bond says, Money Penny, what would I do without you? My problem is you never do anything with me. It's a date, he says. That's it for me. That last line is Money Penny pickup banter at its best so far. Her second best. He leads that poor woman on all the time. All she wants to do is take him to bed at least once. For decades. For decades. And for decades, he's like, yeah, I'll let you taste this dick. <laughs> he kisses her and leaves. M comes over the tannoy. What would I do without you, Miss Moneypenny? Thank you. I'm beginning to think M's two-way communication device is... Is always on. Always both on. Ways. Both ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's not two-way. It's one way straight to M's office. It's just an open line. Just an open listening device. He hears everything that goes on out there. Yes. This was all clever and cute, but it all could have been avoided if M didn't do any of that in the first place. 
And what the fuck did the PM want from Bond about this? Yeah, yeah, where where was the PM? He wanted to be informed right away. How come uh, nobody gave him a message or why well, he didn't show up or Mr. Prime Minister James Bond is back. Very good. All right, cool. That's actually all I wanted. Send him back now. What? Hard cut to Tracy in her cougar, top down. Windows up for the composite close-ups and down for the wides. That's an editing thing, right? That's a continuity error. Right there, where's your continuity girl? Fire that bitch. She pulls into her father's party slash Portuguese rodeo, filmed at Divinho Estate at the village of Samba Hall near Lisbon. More specifically than that, though, she pulls in next to Bond's Aston. She greets her father and wishes him a happy birthday. Her outfits are always bloody awesome, by the way. Oh, yeah. Tracy always looks good. Dressed to the nines. She looked good the whole movie. I'm going to throw myself in the ocean. I'm going to look fucking good. Mm -hmm. Her father then introduces her to Bond, knowing full well that they've already slept together. She gives Bond the cold shoulder, and when he calls her out on it, she walks away. She likes you, I can see it, Draco says. You must give me the name of your oculist. See, there are some good snappy lines in here every now and then. Throw out 50, you're bound to get one. Tracy goes to talk to her father's lover, Olympi, played by Virginia North. No relations to West. Hmm. But dubbed by, you guessed it, Nikki Vandersil. Tracy quickly realizes that even Olympi is pushing her to bond, even slipping about an arrangement, which Tracy leads her off to explain. Meanwhile, Duke gets gored by a bull. Happy birthday, Draco. Yeah, this is a real ass bullfight. That was fucking awesome. Again, the Bond movies bring the realness. They're going to do it for real. Do that shit for real. Let's get some bullfighters in here. Dude got gored. Dude got gored. It wasn't pretty either. Tracy and Olympi join Bond and Draco at a table. Draco says Bond's there to discuss a business deal. She calls them out for arranging a deal that she's just a piece in. Tell him what he wants to know, Papa, or you'll never see me again. So Draco reveals the connection between Blofeld and a lawyer in Bern, Switzerland named Gebruder Gumbel. Tracy reveals Bond has no more need of her and runs away, and Bond gives chase. I like how she blackmails her dad into giving Bond the information that he wants, just so Bond will leave her alone. Yeah, you know, I think she's starting to fall for him, but it's like, you know, I don't want to be with you if this is all you care about. Good, now you have no more reason to give a shit, you know, you don't care, get out of here, now leave me alone. <laughs> he finds her crying by her car and turns her around, professing his love essentially to her. Or at least his willingness to be a real lover to her. Wiping away her tears as Louis Armstrong starts singing the immortal love song, We Have All the Time in the World. Words that have made many a Bond fan cry. We go straight into love montage. This love scene is ridiculous. It seems like something out of Brian's song. They embrace and we dissolve into a love montage. Horseback riding. Walks with a cat through a garden, walking on a sidewalk, running and playing on a beach, walking again in that same park but in different clothes. <laughs> Fuck his suit in this shot. <laughs> Extend a couple of the previous shots and end with them looking at rings through a window. That was fun. Cut to bears. That was fun. Cut to bears. And that's pretty much how it goes. As a 1968 Rolls Royce Silver Shadow rolls by Bern, Switzerland. It's Draco's, and his daughter and her new boy toy are in the back, making puppy dog faces at each other. And it's making him feel exactly how we do. Weird and uncomfortable, because that's how I felt. But I love that fucking car. That Silver Shadow, that's Rolls Royce's best car, in my opinion. It's up there. It's better than the ones they had in From Russia with Love. It is the car that uh, Indiana Jones traded for a tank. Do you like it more than Goldfinger's Rolls Royce? Yes. Goldfinger's Rolls Royce was ostentatious. It had to be. He loves gold. Draco's Rolls has no rear doors. The driver has to let you out through the seat like your friend's shitty car in high school. Uh, I like the two-door design. It's nice. Bond goes to see Advocate Gumbold. Gumbold, played by James Bree, locks his office and heads to lunch, walking right past Bond who B and E's his way into said office immediately afterward. Sid's sets are perfect now. He still favors larger sets, but they're not as big when they don't need to be. And more importantly, they're not as sparsely decorated, making them feel more real. With, to be fair, a lot of that credit going to Peter Lamont again. Uh, okay, we'll give it up for Peter Lamont, because like I said earlier, the sets were good. They are 
set decor. Yeah, they uh they work fine. The sets work fine because they don't take you out of the show and they don't draw your focus to them themselves. Except for that fucking casino. Except for that casino. Bond looks out on the balcony and a man in a high vis jacket signals a crane operator to drop a bucket. The man stuffs a case into the bucket and smacks it. The bucket lifts up and over to Bond. The clock tower Bond keeps looking at is the same clock face from the title sequence, by the way. They like the clock, so they're going to use it. I do want to give this Bond some credit. He moves so purposefully when he grabs shit, when he stiff punches people. He really highlights how little Connery wanted to move. <laughs> oh, are you saying Sean Connery's lazy? Yes. <laughs> yes. Sean Connery is incredibly fucking lazy. I'm sorry. The way he like snatches things and just moves and, and, and pushes things and walks and he's so quick and forceful and Sean Connery's like, yeah, I'll get over there in a minute. Hold on. Don't put me in the thing with a fucking shark. <laughs> I don't want to move. I don't want to move. Okay. Don't make me punch either. Bond pulls an old printer out of the case. I'm kidding, it's an automatic safe cracker. It makes his safe cracking kit from the last movie look like it's from the Stone Age, but it also really does look like your mom's printer. Cut to Tracy. She's gushing about Bond. Back to Bond, staring at a Playboy. Hmm. With the safe unlocked, Bond pours through the documents until he finds some to his liking, and then sticks them into his safe cracking machine, because surprise, it is a copy machine. It looks like a printer because it is. It's a photocopier. The music gets tense as Gumbold makes his way back, but Bond returns the safe to normal and throws the case back into the crane bucket before walking out of the office, still staring at the Playboy he stole. Back in London, at Quarterdeck, M's personal home, which is not in Scotland, Bond pulls in, and Hammond, played by John Gay, lets him in. This palatial home burned down in real life. It is a nice house, though. It is a nice house. It's a shame it burned down. The set for M's house on the inside is very big with room to spare, even though there's fine art and collected butterflies bloody everywhere. Bond emasculates the butterfly that M is pinning, and by extension M, which his face shows perfectly. Yeah, how are you going to talk shit about your boss's hobby? That's just brutal. It was mean. It was mean. It was an info brag, but it wasn't. It was just mean. It was just a dig. Mm -hmm. I wasn't aware your expertise extended into lepidoptery. M is also starting to wonder how this guy knows everything in these info brags. <laughs> like, how does, how does how, yeah. Well, when did you have time to study this shit? M reveals the letters he copied were sent by Count Balthazar de Bluchon to the London College of Arms. Bluchon being French for Blue Field, the same as Blofeld. Yes. Obviously an alias. He asked for permission to go to the college to talk to them about it. So after some establishing shots, Bond meets with Sir Hilary Bray, played by George Baker, a neighbor of Peter Hunt. Baker would also provide the dubbing of Bond in the scenes when Bond is disguised as Sir Hilary Bray, as Peter thought Lazenby's impersonation was naff. Because it, it, it probably was naff. <laughs> <laughs> and why is every English academic a knighted Hillary. It's not the first Sir Hillary I've come across in academia. Please, call him Hilly. <laughs> Bray shows Bond his coat of arms, and the theory should have, again, been dead in the water here, as the arms of Sir Thomas Bond has the family motto, the world is not enough. Right? The first time you see this, the first time that we establish Bond's paternal history. His ancestor, Sir Thomas Bond. Bray lets Bond know that Blofeld is trying to claim the title of Count Bluchon, and they arrange to have Sir Bray go verify the claim in Bern. But Sir Bray will lose himself amongst the old churches of Brittany, whilst Bond goes disguised as Bray in his stead. Bray also tells Bond that the Bluchon have no earlobes by genetic characteristic. Now, when I first heard this, I thought, everybody has earlobes. 
What they mean is yes, I know it's not a connected earlobe. They they don't have the a, a dangly earlobe. It's a double whammy of an attached earlobe that is incredibly really small by genetic preference, looking as if there is no earlobe, which happens. I've seen it. Yeah, I know. I've seen it. I've seen people with small ears. Yes. Cut to an establishing shot of Switzerland. Bon gets off a train, and watching over him is that blonde construction dude from earlier, the one that helped him when he was making copies. Making copies. His name is Sean Campbell, played by Bernard Horsfall. Bond is quickly approached by Irma Blunt, played by Ilsa Stapa, and Yosef, played by Joseph Vasa. Bond is dubbed by the actor who plays Bray, as I said here, and there are times, like when Yosef grabs his luggage, that... You will not see Bond's jaw moving whilst you hear him speaking. In fact, there are a lot of these. Yeah. Stop ADRing more lines in. <laughs> Stop it. Stop adding more shit. They tuck into a two-horse sleigh. For real. For real. Covered themselves with a pelt and departed while Bond puffs on a pipe, not too dissimilar from Bray's, leaving a smoke trail you could follow for miles, which is good, because Campbell has to up the mountain in a 1969 Volkswagen Beetle. And I have to do this again, and I'm sorry, but in You Only Live Twice, I was so caught up on the driver being The Rock's grandpappy that I forgot to mention he was driving a 1964 Dodge Pallara. Back to Sean Campbell following Bond's smoke trail in a Beetle. <laughs> <laughs> that Beetle had a hard time getting up the hill, too, because it's so sped up that everyone is power walking. Maybe everyone just power walks in Switzerland. What the fuck do I know? Uh, I don't think that's true. But yes, <laughs> it's sped up. They had issues with all of the driving on the mountain and the sand. and Well, they kept not shooting there because they couldn't get enough snow. And then this season, they had way too much. Yeah. Bunt and Bon get to the chopper. <laughs> They'll get the rest of the way up the mountain that way, leaving Campbell watching on. Now, we are treated to a mini montage of Alpine money shots. Gorgeous shots of the mountains as they fly over. Bunt turns into a tour guide and points out avalanche damage to him and us, the audience. They also show skiers and a dude bobsledding, all in a quick bit of setup. They literally montage their setups for the film in like five seconds. They literally do. They fly to the top of Blouchamps Mountain, which is the Schildhorn Mountain above Murin, Switzerland. At the top, Blouchamps built some allergy research clinic that's really an evil lair in, in their universe. But in our universe, was a revolving restaurant under construction called the Peas Gloria. So to get permission to film there, they had to pay 60,000 pounds in 60s money to furnish the place and build the functioning helipad that we see now huh. as one that they could permanently use. Wow. That's kind of nuts. 60,000 pounds in 60s money, that's a lot of money. That is kind of nuts. If you go to that restaurant today, by the way, it's still there. They are obsessed with the fact that Bond was filmed there. Who wouldn't be? And what is up with Blowfield and Mountain Lairs? Apparently this dude likes to live in mountains. Likes mountains. I like mountains. I agree. I get that. I get that. You know, there's a serenity to that. When you're when you're full of malice and hate, you really need all the serenity <laughs> you can get. <laughs> you really need all the serenity. Gotta go live on top of a mountain or in an old volcano or something. like. <laughs> need a freaking hollow that volcano. Bond says he'll be happy to get his feet on the ground. And she says, not ground, ice. But it's clearly built on rock. <laughs> but it's clearly built on rock. Ice moves, lady. Not ice. Rock. Because ice moves and melts. You can't build on ice. When the chopper lands, Braun, played by George Lane Cooper, and his band of taxi-flavored goons go to greet them, rolling out the black carpet. Right before they walk into an ice tunnel, you can clearly see the Piz Gloria sign on the wall. The ice tunnel is done well. Has that scooped look to the walls that these things actually have from air passing through them. Convincing. A very convincing ice tunnel if you've ever been in one. Mm -hmm. On the other side of the edit, I mean tunnel, they enter a set. <laughs> Looks like a clinic, nothing special. Oh, except for this giant fucking coat of arms on the wall taking up half the frame. But other than that... Yes, nothing special. She has Bond checked up by the doctor, and they check his bags before checking him into his room. That's a lot of checking. There's a lot of checking. There's checking going on of the checking. She also tells Blofeld his guest has arrived. After showing him his room, 
She says she'll send for him at seven to meet her in the Alpine room. She departs, and Bon futilely searches his room for bugs as a marching band version of We Have All the Time in the World plays. Kind of odd. At least he, he learns some things, I guess? He didn't necessarily check the corners, but he did check for bugs. He's immediately checking for bugs, yeah. Connery learned that at the end. Mm-hmm. This is a holdover. He should go check that bathroom in those corners, though. He should go check the bathroom in the corners. The helicopter leaps, and Bond is committed on this mountaintop now. So he dons a kilt and full Scott garb and hits the alpine room, which is stocked with swankily dressed ladies. A bunch of them, and every one of them are like, Oh, a man! Uh, that, that's what I wrote in my notes. Ooh, a man! An international bevy of beauties. Apparently, each one of those girls in the movie represented a different international ethnicity. Well, they were supposed to, so you get the idea that they could be, each be sent to a separate corner of the world. Mm hmm. Which comes into point later. These are allergy test subjects, so to speak. As they gush over Sir Bray's titles, the background rotates from lounge to dining room. Also, she serves him steak, Pis Gloria, in another honor for the under construction restaurant they shot on and around. I suppose it would not be a Bond movie if there wasn't at least one rotating room. They ADR more lines in after the fact that are obviously put in when no one is talking on set. The girls get him to talk about the College of Arms, and he goes on forever, and it's so fucking boring, but they're all enwrapped. They fade into a later time, and they're still all just wide-eyed amazed at every word he's saying, as he's now gotten to listing when each house was certified for their coat, and what different stuff on them mean. These women would be asleep. One girl writes her room number in lipstick on his thigh under the table. This is Ruby Bartlett, played by Angela Scular, who you may recognize as Buttercup in Casino Royale 1967, with her eternal nickname, Daddy's Little Thermometer. <laughs> the other girls are played by Anuska Hempel, Danny Sheridan, Helena Rooney, Ingrid Back, Jenny Hanley, Joanna Lumley, Julie Ege, Mona Chong, Silvana Henriquez, and Zahira, who is billed as Zara, with Katharina Von Schell as Nancy, the only other one to get a name in the credits. Bray Bond is called to meet with the Count. He's taken through a few rooms, which are a succession of sets, showing off how Sid Kane had improved and was closer in style to his teacher now, even if still not as good. I mean, don't misunderstand. These are amazing sets. But remember when you said Ken Adams set apartment trends in the 60s? Yeah. Sid Kane made some impeccable sets here, but he wasn't setting any trends. No, no, his sets were impeccable, but he wasn't setting any trends. In Blouchon's apartment slash office slash lab, <laughs> Sir Hilary Bray meets Count Balthazar de Blouchon. And how the flying fuck is Blofeld not like, Good evening, Mr. Bond, nice to see you again. I know it's been two years, but I doubt he'd forget the dude who fucked up his evil SpaceX volcano. They met before, right? Why doesn't he recognize him? So the answer in our universe, because they don't give one in their universe, is they're literally Jurassic Park 3 it. The feathers have been there the whole time. Basically, it's don't question it. <laughs> don't ask. Seriously, so basically Peter Hunt said, I'm going to do OHMSS. I'm going to do it by the book. I'm not going to change anything in the book. And because this story came before Yolt, this is where he meets Blofeld. But if that's the case, how come he's still chasing Blofeld after two years? You know what I mean? Like They tried to have their cake and eat it too, and that's why it comes off incredibly fucking confusing. And to this day, people are like, why didn't Blofeld recognize him? Yeah. Maybe it's because they're both different people now, as Blofeld was also recast to Telly Savalas. But for real, if these two immediately recognized each other, then they're playing it off well, and their characters are better actors than George Lazenby. <laughs> Wooden line delivery coupled with shark jumping over the top moments when action is called for, this guy should have stayed a telecommercial model. He's not the greatest of actors, but he's not the worst. Yes, he is. He's damn near. <laughs> they go over the Bluchon verification a little bit, and Blofeld explains that they lock everyone up to control the variables and so on since it's an allergy test center. So, later on, locked up in his room at night, Bond clips two bits of rubber eraser around a long strip of metal and uses it to short out the door. He goes to Ruby's room and cheats on Tracy, 
Yes, he does. He goes to Ruby's room. Well, she did fucking stick her hand up his kilt, give him a tug, and write her room number down. Oh, yeah. Like, next time I cheat on my wife, that's what I'm going to say. Yeah, well, you could say no and not go to her room. Well, exactly. That's my point. He's a piece of shit. And we're supposed to give a fuck about his love being the purest here. Yeah. When Bond drops his kilt, Ruby cackles, wildly screaming, It's true! For some reason. (laughs) They bang. And Bond gets her to dish about her allergies and why she's there. While that's going on, odd tones start emanating from the roof as some cool lights from Spencer's starts going off above her and in the other subject's room. Blofeld starts a set of tapes to play along with this, and sadly, it's not the Pink Floyd discography. The girls are all hypnotized, and the tapes cure them of their allergies. Bond leaves and goes back to his room and finds Nancy waiting on him. She used a nail file instead of his whole setup. Smart lady. She said it's so easy, and he said, I wouldn't know, as if she wasn't just waiting for him in his room at 4 a.m. for two hours. Right? Like, how fucked you get out then, if you didn't know? You're such a bad fucking liar. He uses the exact same three lines on her as the girl before, by the way, and they bang. Oh yeah, the exact same line. Worse than freshman me in high school. Cut to Campbell, and he's stuck at the ski lodge at the bottom and he goes to the private gondola, asking about a lift to the top, and Grunther tells him to shove off. Yeah, yeah, with a submachine gun. Grunther is played by Yuri Boryenko, who Lazenby had his screen test with. Lazenby threw a punch and broke Yuri's nose, which landed Lazenby a job, and Yuri the more prominent role of the muscle in the form of Grunther here. Yeah. Back up top, the girls are curling, and once again, clearly in frame of the Piz Gloria restaurant sign. Bond arrives, and there's a boner joke. I'm not kidding. Yep, there is a total boner joke. Cut to Campbell going full Alex Honnold on the cliff face up to the mountain. Some rat-ass birds give him away, though, and the guards shoot at him. Blofeld comes up as the guards bring Campbell over. Blofeld says, Piz Gloria is private property. So, okay. I guess Blofeld named his lair and put it up like a restaurant sign. <laughs> Piz Gloria. <laughs> uh, yeah, vain, vanity, whatever. Was that really easier than just covering the sign or not keying it into frame? Because it's definitely a worse idea. It is a worse idea, but I bet you they got a discount on that 60,000 pounds. <laughs> we'll show your name off if you cut 10 grand off. You're right. Bond keeps trying to get Blofeld to move the direction he wants, but Blofeld, every step of the way, counters masterfully. Crossfade to Alpine glory shots. Ah, oh, yeah, that's nice. Look at those hard, rigid peaks covered in white. All jokes aside, I love these establishing inserts of mountains. Oh, yeah, no. The mountain shots are great. Switzerland looks good. As night has fallen, Bond has snuck out again, and this time he has learned, carrying a nail file. He goes into Ruby's room, but as he pulls back the covers on the bed, he finds Irma Bunt waiting on him instead. It's a trap. Dun, dun, dun. Fancy meeting you here, Fraulein, as he's knocked up fuck out from behind by Grunther with a nightstick. Always knocked out from behind. It, it, like, it seems like if Bond was surprised, he would immediately look behind him, because that's the next thing that's gonna happen. <laughs> Shit, I'm surprised. Turn around, fast. Right? Train yourself to, for that to be a reflex of surprise, not a dumb face. And a bad line. Bond's face is meme-worthy here as he falls unconscious. Lazenby sucks. <laughs> He's not that bad. He's horrible. This is fucking horrible. That face, the one you're seeing as you're listening to this. He wakes up on a leather couch, looking up at a Christmas tree. Merry Christmas, 007. Blofeld says, as he knew all along, because how the fuck wouldn't you? Right. Bond tries to keep up the charade, but Blofeld calls him out on it. And Bond calls him out on cutting his earlobes off. So Blofeld taunts having killed Campbell to Bond. More importantly than all of that, is Blofeld says that he now has the scientific means to control or destroy the economy of the whole world. He's basically a Wall Street banker. I don't know why he keeps going after the economy. I just love such vague threats. I have the technology now to control or destroy the economy of the whole world. It's like, fucking, what? What a blanket statement. Yeah, Uh, yeah, exactly. I don't believe you have shit now, man. (laughs) Kind of vague. What do you got? In typical Bond fashion, they take a topical crime of the era and have the baddie take claim for it. 
This time, foot and mouth outbreak in England. Oh, that was a big deal, though, foot and mouth in England. And considering the plot of, you know, viral spreading, Blofeld takes credit for that. Blofeld rocks here. Way better than in the last film. This guy is effeminate still, but manly at the same time and threatening. He feels psychotic yet controlled and genius. He feels like Blofeld. Kelly Savalas was super menacing in this. It was that undercurrent menacing, like that kind of menacing that Michael Keaton can do, where, you know, you're having a normal conversation, but you're still pretty fucking scared. You don't know why, but the conversation was scary. It was normal, but scary. He does hold cigarettes fucking weird, though. Perhaps he got that from Mike Myers. As Blofeld continues, what he's really discovered is the ability to tailor a sterility virus, virus omega, to plant and or animal species to single out and or wipe out a species forever. This has nothing to do with anything of what he just said before, but okay. No, nothing, nothing to do with economies. That's why I was confused. If his demands aren't met, he's going to wipe grains and livestock off the face of the planet. You're just going to starve people to death. So, yes, that's devastating for the economy, but it's equally devastating for people who eat grains and meat. That's not an economic crisis, that's a humanitarian crisis. Yes, exactly. It's like, yeah, no shit that's going to cause the economy to crash. Everyone starved to death. <laughs> so, that's his plan? He takes girls who have allergies to stuff? Because in this universe, by the way, you're allergic to what you're subjected to most, so chicken farm girls allergic to chickens? Then he hypnotizes you to love chickens and hug all of them, and gives you the Omega Virus chicken variant, and sends you home, Bob's your uncle, give me money. That's his plan. After Blofeld tells him everything, he then says he'll let Bond live to help him convince the authorities, when the time is right, that he is Blofeld and that he will kill the world, so don't fuck with him, pay the man. I figure an example of your power would be best and just kill this dude because he's always a thorn in your side. But that's just me thinking like a rational sociopath. I mean, that's just you, honestly, you know, being, once again, a far smarter secret agent than James Bond. There you go. They shove Bond into a cramped, caged-off room full of gears for the gondola. But before this, he sees Campbell's body dangling from the mountain, and he tries to futilely fight the guards. I guess he kind of tries to fight, and it was futile. He tries to climb across the gears, but the gondola starts moving, and he drops, grabbing a small jutting chunk of metal, and holds his other hand over the top of the first in a technique we in the climbing community call the Lazenby Maneuver. <laughs> I don't believe you. It's the best way to grip your hold if you want to die. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> seriously, though, he's been hanging there for a seriously long time. He's dead. Yeah. He rips out his pockets to make mittens and then slides across a cable to get to the other side of the room. But the gondola starts again and shoots him back the way he came, towards the gears. He swings and drops and catches himself on the ledge, near where he started by his fingertips again. And damn, how is he holding on? <laughs> He's there forever, too, while the gondola goes up and down the whole mountain. Right? I mean, it goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down, it goes like back and forward. They're going to the Costco with all the goons, and they can only fit so many in. And yeah, but how long does it take to get to the bottom and the top? Because it seems like it's only a minute. Yeah, it should take you minutes, but it's like 60 seconds of him hanging there is still long. He would be dead. Right, right, yeah. He climbs up and tries again, because the definition of insanity. But Bond's just got that speedrunner mentality. He knew he just wasn't fast enough, but somehow has the energy to climb up and shimmy over again, but even faster this time, and still barely makes it when the gondola goes. Are those guards bored? What's going on? There's like three of them. Are they playing with the gondola switch? That's what they're doing. Is they click on, off, on, off. You guys can't make it up the mountain. <laughs> Bond dead hangs shimmies on the cable outside now, and the cable car returns, threatening to chop his fingers and send him plummeting down the mountain face. Bond swings slightly and somehow teleports to the connecting shaft of the gondola about six to eight feet away and on the other side of a bulky cable roller part. <laughs> you could have just had somebody drop onto the gondola and not magically teleport to the top of the connection rod. It would have been way more believable. Yeah. 
I never really know what time it's supposed to be because the sky is always different. Yeah, it's always night day. I've noticed that too. They shot the scene 12 times and I like this bit, you know, and I like this bit. And so it's like the sky was literally like more dusky a minute ago. Again, editor. Bond gives up and tries to sneak through the building to go out the front door. He fights the guy at the front desk and dons a ski outfit and kit. He again does the double one-liner and they both suck. He says, Merry Christmas and maybe you should have been gift wrapped. Yeah, again. Not a lot of great one-liners in this one. Bond skis down the mountain at night without a headlamp. That's a bold choice, Cotton. Oh, man. The guards shoot at him and take off after him. Here, we have our first big action set piece. We've had a couple of fight sequences, but this is the first big chase or stunt or anything. An hour and a half into the film. In the last one, we had like four by now. I'm not saying you need to have constant action, but what I am saying is that this film is boring and a lot closer to Casino Royale 67 than any other Bond film, even down to the harem of girls trying to ruin his celibate image. Uh, what do you mean, trying to ruin? <laughs> Blofeld joins the ski chase also, because why not? Yeah, he's an accomplished skier. And we're treated to some of the worst brain-melting transitions ever. And again, after the last movie, it kind of sticks out. It does, it does. Like the direction, like you miss Toho immediately. This chase is supposed to be at night, and a variety of tactics were used to get the sequence done, including Lazenby composited in for close-ups, a stuntman doing easier bits in the dark, and the harder bits during the day, with a very obvious day-for-night color grading done in post. Very obvious. The guards shoot at Bond while skiing, and Bond and the guards all pull off some sweet jumps. Grunther's fat ass is amazing at skiing, apparently. Or the stuntman was. They do some dope-ass skiing, though, I gotta admit. Jumps off of houses and shit. Mm -hmm. Blofeld's closing in, and the guards shoot one of Bond's skis apart, causing him to ski off on one foot. This stunt is actually kind of cool, and of course the stuntman did it for real, because it's Bond. Because it's Bond, yeah. Yes, and skiing on one ski back in the day, this is before mono skis, before snowboards. That's some ballsy-ass shit right there. A guard launches himself into a tree. And Grunther stops the movie to call him an idiot, and I burst out laughing. That's the best <laughs> moment of the movie for me. Uh, it was kind of funny. Another guard hits another tree, and Bond crashes, breaking his other ski. A goon flies in the air towards him, and Bond hits him with a ski bit, and he falls off the ledge. Well, a dummy does. For a long time. And they hold on it. For a long time. They hold on it all, almost all the way down. No, they hold on it the whole way down until it hits. So far below, they don't even bother with a sound effect. Like nobody could hear that anyway. So there you go. Then the second tree guard catches up and also gets knocked the fuck out. Bond steals his skis as Blofeld and co. pull up nearby. And has to strangle the goon with his own ski when he comes to to keep him quiet as the other guards pass. That was uh, kind of brutal. And skis have sharp edges, so he should have, like, almost chopped that dude's head off. They struggle on the edge, and Bond just throws him over. The man screams the whole way down, and every member of Blofeld's platoon should be turning around now like, He's up there! But I guess no one heard that. No, nobody heard that. Otherwise, how is he gonna get away? Cut to Bond, back down in the village, and the Trojan girls Blofeld called his angels of death are being bussed away to go back where they came from. Irma Bunt waves them off as a 1963 Mercedes 220S with three goons pick her up and drive off honking the entire time. On the hunt for Mr. Bond, who just is casually walking through the crowd now. Just stealing people's clothing? Mm-hmm. Braun jumps out of the car and chases Bond into a barn full of bells, and they scuffle. Short fight. Mostly Bond pushing away and Braun grabbing. Little by way of punches thrown and such. And the fight is actually kind of annoying because they're constantly knocking into bells. Yeah, like, why didn't not everyone hear that? Like, what the fuck's going on in the bell room? Bond dispatches Braun and another goon that runs in, and then Bond dives out of the window saying, Goodbye. <laughs> Irma calls the goons idiots, and Bond steals a jacket, but Fat Load of Good It did him because they immediately make him again. Well, yeah, you can just wear a jacket, but you got on the same fucking onesie underneath. Which is a very specific color of powdered blue. Blue, red. And ski boots, so, you know, 
As Bond is being cornered near a skating rink, there's a jump scare with a park photographer in a horrific polar bear costume with a maniacal laugh. Uh, was that scary? I thought it was just kind of annoying. Bond sits down surrounded, cold, dejected. He feels trapped. Dude, it's three D-level goons and a fat old woman. You've already been kicking their asses and you're surrounded by public now. What the fuck ever? Yeah, it was kind of a lame, just kind of giving up. I'm going to sit here. For no reason. to figure something out, I guess. Sean Connery's Bond, almost to a cartoonish fault, no matter what, until the bullet is between his eyes, is always believes completely that he can and will find a way out of it. And to be fair, he always does. This guy just, I've already gotten away, I've been surrounded by public, and I'm just going to sit here at this skating rink and just give up, because fuck it, I guess I'm trapped. Yeah, I don't know what his thinking was in that moment. It's so Tracy can rescue him, and their love means something, and people can defend it in 2022 and act like his love for her was better than any relationship he ever had in any other of the Daniel Craig movies, because fuck Daniel Craig. It's never going to be as good as these old movies were. So in this low moment for Bond, when all is lost and he's giving up, Tracy skates right in front of him, stops, and smiles at him. Convenient. <laughs> she takes him to her car, but really. It was the fireworks that saved him. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she actually took forever to take off her skates before escaping, and the guards never moved past that spot. They just got distracted and overwhelmed by the crowd and the fireworks. So literally, all he had to do was keep moving a little longer, and car or no, he was free. Yeah. In fact, the part I can't believe he didn't get caught at was when he was getting into her car, dude was looking right at him. Yeah. Well, if obviously they didn't see them. It was the jacket and the stupid hat. There's another joke about a woman having a nice stare at breast, say something else, insert laugh here. It was better the first couple of times. Even though the Merc was nowhere near behind them, it's instantly caught up when Bond goes into a call box into the next town, and they do not hesitate to light the call box with machine fire. They light the whole area up. Bond dives into the car and kisses Tracy, calling her a good girl for driving off as if Aki didn't save him twice out of nowhere in a bespoke Toyota GT two years ago. How quickly we forget. How quickly we forget. They're all good girls, James. They all do the same thing. They drive the car. I guess they're making up for the lack of action set pieces with this first one being 20 minutes long. This is still the chase that started at the top of the mountain. Yes, this is still the chase that started at the top of the mountain. They are still actively looking for Bond. Bond keeps necking Tracy, and dude was cheating on you with anything that moved up there, girl. I'm just saying, know your worth, you're Diana Rigg. <laughs> All jokes aside, I guess what I'm hinting at is she's done nothing that others haven't done, done more of, or done better. Their relationship has seemed nothing but toxic and forced so far. So why this one? What makes this relationship the ultimate one to all the old dusty Bond heads? Well, let me tell you, nostalgia and being a mark. Tracy crashes into a stock car race, as we alluded to in the credits, and turns it into a demolition derby. That cougar had some amazing torque and handling on ice. Gotta say, I want one now. Great commercial. Great commercial, and if you've never seen ice racing, that's about what it looks like, for reals. It's a lot of fun. Looks like we've hit the rush hour, Bond says. She says, I hope my big end will stand up to this. Uh, I don't know who the writer was of the one-liners, but they didn't do good. Richard Maypalm. <laughs> Tracy rams a stock car into the Merc until it hits the barrier and flips, exploding and killing the occupants. But wait, they cut back after Bond and Tracy drive away and the goons and Bunt are crawling out before it explodes again. Like the A-Team or something. Yeah, yeah. It explodes twice, but we had to get a shot of the pre-explosion before it exploded again of everybody getting out. Now, when it explodes again and the stunt doubles are running away... The double for Irma Blunt is the last one to get out of the car, and didn't get away very fast. Now look at Irma Blunt's stunt double when the second explosion goes off. That double had a singed ass for weeks. Oh yeah, she caught the fireball a little bit. Oh, a lot of it. <laughs> <laughs> Shortly after, Bond and Tracy are in a blizzard and running out of gas. Bond tries to wipe snow off of the windshield by wiping the inside of the glass. Brilliant. Yeah, what? That's not how that works. And before you say he was wiping away the foggy condensation, there was known as the image shown now illustrates. <laughs> He's going to bring the receipts too. 
60% of this movie's dialogue was ADR'd in afterwards, and 30% of that was when no one was talking in this film. They hide out from the storm in a barn, and she asked him what really went on up there, and he says, ah, government business, sorry toots, but hey, will you marry me? <laughs> yeah, by the way, you saved my life, will you marry me? I think I love you. I, I did just bang a couple of English chicks up <laughs> on top of the mountain, but I do love you. But we weren't married yet. <laughs> they kiss, but Bond puts off sex for a New Year's resolution and says their wedding night will be the proper time for such things. And wow, this really is Casino Royale 67 all over again. We're trying to change the tone. But then, surprise, he knocks her cot down and she rolls on to him as he says, it's not New Year yet. The horses look on with approval. They fail miserably in trying to change the tone. I mean, they tried to change the tone, but then they... Oh, well, they changed the tone. ...revert back to the old, same old shit. This was bad. The next morning, Blofeld and squad kick in the barn door and find the cougar, but no Bond or Tracy. They'd already left skiing down the mountain. I guess there were some skis in that horse barn. Yeah, you didn't see them when they pulled in? A whole ski rack full of skis. That's fucking convenient. A horse's ski, I guess. Convenient people just leave skis sitting around. Amazing helicopter shot over the Swiss Alps as they ski down. Fucking gorgeous. I mean it. Truly amazing shots as Blofeld catches up. The goons shoot at them with implausibly large guns to hold and fire while skiing. But okay. Bond and Tracy's stunt doubles jump over snow-capped cabins. They also jump over a trench made by a huge snowblower, which the goons follow. One falling into the mower of the machine and becoming a red stain on the snow. Very Fargo. The other goons ski underneath the arch of human snow whilst Bond smiles at Tracy. He had lots of guts. The only one-liner I wrote down. Yeah, that was the one. They enter an avalanche area and Blofeld tells three goons to keep going while stopping with the rest. And they had to be the dumbest three in his squad because they didn't hesitate. They were some dumb goons, man. Blofeld sets off a signal flare near a snow face, and it somehow starts an avalanche. They usually throw dynamite into the snow, but okay. Yeah, well, that was definitely a signal flare. The camera cannot pan back fast enough to keep up with this incredibly massive avalanche that they set off for this. It is beyond insane in scale. The Swiss Army had planted charges the summer before they filmed, so that they were buried proper when they set this off. Yeah, this was a massive avalanche. This was very real. I'm surprised they got to uh, film that because it was super real and they were really close. The three dumb goons predictably get washed away by the avalanche. Bond and Tracy head for the trees, which in real life would not save you. Remember the setup for the avalanche when Bunt showed the damage of all the trees blown down? Exactly. Trees aren't going to help you. <laughs> Rocks aren't going to help you. The rest of the sequence is headache-inducing, a combination of model shots and actual avalanche composited badly with the actors and stunt skiers falling so far apart and ending up tumbling together in the snow, when in real life, it would be the other way around. It would toss you from each other. Whenever it does cut back to actual shots of the avalanche, it's always breathtaking, though. Yeah, it's one of the best avalanche scenes that I've seen in a movie. Probably the best. Yeah. With Bond and Tracy buried under snow, Blofeld orders his men to kidnap Tracy for reasons. Reasons. I don't know why. He even totally thinks Bond is buried deep enough to stay dead, even though he just sits up after they take Tracy. Yeah, he just takes Tracy as a, a trophy, because that's what men did back in the day. Who they bloody drag down the rocky mountain face as they ski away. What the fuck? Like just sort of dragging her by her hair. Like, <laughs> to the cave. <laughs> to the cave, right. Blur transition to Bond at M's office. The UN has informed M they're going to give in to Blofeld's demands of amnesty for past crimes and verification of desired titles. Bond wants to storm Piz Gloria and destroy it, positing that without Blofeld's voice, the girls could do nothing, which is hilariously false. They're already armed and planted. Yeah, I mean, those girls are ticking genetic time bombs. Like, at any moment, they could just go off. M says, nope, we have orders not to, it's too risky. You notice how there's no Q scene? Yes, I did notice how there's no Q scene. There's no Q gadgets, no Q scene. 
Remember, they snuck him dropping some joke gadgets in the pre-title and were like, well, that's checked and tucked in some biscuits and tea. I felt robbed. I felt completely robbed. Bond's phone rings and he picks it up, but the dialogue that follows is of Bond calling Draco to interest him in a demolition project. Yeah, it was weird, right? That was weird. Like, did he call his secretary to connect the call before? No, because his phone rang and then he <laughs> picked it up. So my guess is he left a message, but that wasn't ever clarified. So it right. just feels like Bond's phone rang, and then he started saying, hey, I called you. <laughs> Draco brings the choppers and the men to save his daughter and the world. Well, save his daughter and stop Blofeld from getting pardoned. High stakes. High stakes. Bond just really wants Blofeld. Well, that's the only believable part about all this. Somehow, all this time, Tracy is still alive and just chilling on a couch, talking shit back and forth with Blofeld. Blofeld tosses between trying to bed and wed Tracy to threatening her at her refusal. Typical Blofeld stuff, but definitely smooth as fuck. And a little creepy, but... In the best way. And, yeah, not in a bad way. In an evil villain way. Grunther informs Blofeld of the helicopters heading their way, and Blofeld has a message sent requesting their call sign pilot name, and destination. Draco says he's leading a Red Cross supply convo to Italy. The goons say they have no record of their flight plan or registration. And Draco says, your registrations must be out of date, as Tracy listens in, smiling like a gorgeous damsel in distress waiting to be rescued. Again. Oh man, Draco's con level in this whole scene was masterful. That's better than Han Solo. We're all right here. How are you? <laughs> Conversation was going nowhere anyway. <laughs> Draco says it's an emergency mercy flight, and a plane flies up telling them to land. Amazing, yes. Send a jet that can't stop going fast to stay aloft after hovering helicopters. Brilliant. Yeah, that's a pretty dumb idea. He bluffs his way through the goons. Their Air Force and Blofeld all believe his con, as he doubles down and says he has press members aboard also. And that seemed to be the magic word. Press. Oh yeah, by the way, we have press. It was the 60s. Tracy feigned sudden interest in the bad guy. It's trope and insulting to Blofeld. But he falls for it and she asks to be taken to the Alpine room to see the dawn before they bang it out. Weakest moment of this Blofeld to me. Yeah, it was the weakest moment of this Blofeld altogether. He suddenly became stupid. Well, I guess pussy has a way of doing that. They head to the Alpine Room and quote poetry at each other. His is romantic in the love sense, and hers more biting and sarcastic, though Blofeld's ego doesn't hear it that way, which is back to form for the character for me, so okay, we cool again. The helicopters approach, and somehow, something on the building blows up. It's like they planted a pyro charge there. It wasn't one of the grenades one of the guys dropped? Ah, my very next line in my script, don't say it's one of the hand grenades, ain't no way they made that throw. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? These are professional mobsters and baseball players. <laughs> Bond and co. shoot indiscriminately at the room with Tracy in it. No worries as long as we get Blofeld and, more importantly, Grunther, who's already been alive way longer than I thought he'd be. Yes, this is like one of those weird surviving villains that you see in some of these movies that you keep expecting to die, but they keep surviving. How is Grunther not dead? <laughs> <laughs> How is he not dead? Blofeld and others hit the deck while some go-getters run outside to shoot at the choppers just to be blown away instantly when someone throws grenades down on them, this time right over them. Yeah, someone was dropping grenades. Blofeld wants to escape. He tells his two remaining goons to get the girl and she knocks one out with a bottle, breaking it over him. She then keeps Grunther at bay with the pointy end of the remains. It takes a lot to break a bottle over a human skull. A champagne bottle, too. Mm. Fuck off, mate. He's not getting up. Not getting up. The battle rages outside between the Expendables. No, not those ones. And inside, Grunther disarms Tracy when he forces her hand against a crystal. Helicopters hovering just overhead whilst dudes film a gunfight sequence with hand-to-hand -hand combat and tumbling stunts down the side of a mountain. Realizing what it is, though, is far more badass than watching it. Yeah. Yeah. Especially after watching hundreds of dudes fighting it out in the last movies, this fight is so slow between so few people that it can stop to have resupply moments in the middle of it on a mountain and it's not unbelievable. No, not, not unbelievable at all. It is a much slower 
case fewer people fight. A small commando unit versus a small commando unit, as opposed to a team of ninjas versus everybody. Yeah, the climax here is not as crazy by far as we've gotten used to. They've been escalating, and I mean, Peter said in the beginning he wanted to tone it down. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and he, he did. did. And he did. Grunther tries to strangle Tracy, and she pushes him down the stairs to break his neck. An unceremonious end to a bland goon. Don't mess with mobbed up girls. I'm just saying. For real. They'll break a bottle over your head and, and then throw you down some Push stairs. Push you down the stairs. <laughs> he fell. He was drunk. <laughs> Cut to Bond sliding really quickly on his belly, shooting. Whee! Kind of cool shot when I was a kid, but as an adult, I'm like, dude's about to knock himself out when he hits the edge of this in a second. Right. How's he gonna stop? Dude, you go as a super fat. <laughs> surprise, Grunther's not dead, by the way. Still. Oh, uh, surprise. As Tracy tries to walk over him to the lift, he jumps up at her, and she swings him into a bed of spikes that just so happened to decorate this section of wall. Convenient. Why are you gonna put your back up on those spikes, homie? Well, at least it's a more memorable ending for Grunther. Yes. A few more grenades and some bad smoke effects, and the good guys are in business, baby. No, not tiger business. <laughs> business, business. Bond and Draco find Tracy and send her with Draco's men to be safe. Bond, meanwhile, chases Blofeld, of course. Draco's men wire the place to blow, while some good guy flamethrowers a dude in the ice tunnel. Savage. Savage. Why did they bring a flamethrower? They're a demolition crew, so they brought a flamethrower? It's ice. <laughs> They're a demolition crew. Fair enough. Bond breaks into Blofeld's lab and tries to take photos of the locations of the Death Angels, but Blofeld shoots the map to pieces from behind, and again, dude, just shoot Bond. <laughs> like, you had him. You had him dead in your sights. And you go for the map with a pistol, and he immediately returns fire with a submachine gun. So, stupid. You were stupid. Blofeld runs, and Bond gives chase. Draco and his men evacuate, and Tracy tries to run in to find Bond. So Draco punches her out and has her loaded onto the chopper. Spare the rod, spoil the child, eh? He says. He decks his child. His grown adult daughter child. He decks her. He knocks her. Decks up. her. Fuck out. <laughs> Blofeld and Bond escape just in time, and Blofeld jumps onto a bobsled and cheeses it down the mountain with James in close pursuit after grabbing one himself. This was a dope scene. I love the bobsledding scene. I've always liked bobsledding, and I think it's because of this movie. Blofeld tosses a grenade at Bond, and it explodes right in front of him and his sled, tossing him off the rack some good distance. One of the stuntmen for the bobsled sequence was not hurt by this, but another had to have stitches. Well, I'm sure. So, bobsleds go downhill very fast, right? Yes. Bond was behind Blofeld and got tossed. Yes. And then he ran ahead of Blofeld's sled and pounced onto it. Bobsled courses are notoriously switchbacky. You know how fast that fucking thing is going? You think he, on snow, is going to run from behind it, even with a switchback? It is conceivable. No, it's not. Bond grabs the back fins of the bobsled and is dragged along before climbing up to fight. And that ain't how bobsleds work. Bobsled riders lean into turns, not dual fisticuffs at freeway speeds. No wonder these stuntmen got fucked up. Yeah, you have to lean into the turn and steer. And you have to do all of that pretty quickly and hard. I guess we're back to the old days of the mistakes being better than the stunts. Which is how a real bit of the bobsled flipping in a corner got edited in before somehow magically continuing on its way. Oh yeah, I thought that looked a little shady. Didn't that bobsled flip upside down? That bobsled literally just flipped out of the track upside down. Yeah. I don't know why they they didn't cut like that one second of it doing that out. So, uh, editor. Bond goes back to the rudder and jumps back aboard again. Round two. Fight. <laughs> Bond is nigh invulnerable, but Blofeld can teleport his body 180 degrees instantly. Place your bets now. And it's over. <laughs> Bond kicks Blofeld up into a tree and continues on. He's branched off, Bond says, before bailing and sliding along the mountain as the sled flies off and crashes. Do not understand how he thought that was the best course of action, but okay. Jumping out of a bobsled is not a wise choice. Dissolved to Bond and Tracy getting the ring and getting married. It's a wedding. 
Nothing special or anything this time, though. The best part is Draco and M bonding over a mission that they were on opposite sides of back in the day. Oh, old chap, I've been looking for you for years. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Q shows up and says, good job, you've finally grown up. If there's anything you need. Oh, thanks, Q, but this time I've got the gadgets. Heh <laughs> heh, Bond's got all the sex toys. Great. Bond's got sex toys. He's got a little little English dungeon for a little smack and tickle. Draco gives his daughter the parting advice of always do what your husband says. I like her response better. I will listen to him just like I listen to you, daddy. Bond says Tracy's worth more than the million pound. Yeah, but y'all can still go to Monaco or something. I know it's the honorable thing not to take the money, but, but it's take a the million money. fucking pounds. It's a nice start for a new life. Family, don't right. be a dick. Don't be a dick. It's a wedding gift. Moneypenny cries as the newlyweds drive off in his car with all the time in the world. They stop for James to take the flowers off the car while she outlines her plans for three boys and three girls. Boy first, then girl, and... That's not how that works either, lady. 1969 was not Gattaca. Money Penny was uh, acting like she was at a funeral, then not a wedding. Bond was dead. Well, his penis was to her. To her. A 1964 Mercedes-Benz 600 pulls a drive-by with Blofeld at the wheel and Bunt, armed with a fucking M16A1 with custom muzzle brake hanging out the window. She lights up Bond's car, and he curses Blofeld, jumping back in to give chase. He looks over and Tracy has taken a single shot, dead center forehead, right between the eyes, as they say. Ow. James Bond's true love didn't even get the chance to take her on a honeymoon. Why do they love each other? Um, because one of the screenwriters wrote that. <laughs> a motorcycle cop pulls up as Bond cradles Tracy. It's all right. It's quite all right, you see. We'll be along shortly. We have all the time in the world. He collapses his face into hers, and we hear the whimper of crying as the producer's card comes up. And I'm sorry to ruin this moment, but they were parked on a cliff next to water. Yeah. They always got to end on or next to water. Oh, yes, yes, they do. I've seen yeah. people praising his performance here in this death scene, saying, like, Craig would never have pulled that off. Connery wouldn't even pull that off. Hearing that criticism and then watching the scene lasted, like, five seconds. Wasn't that great, was still pretty wooden, he's a horrible actor, and only got as good as it got because they made him stay up 48 hours and he was exhausted just to get him to act like that. Yeah, so, not the greatest actor in the world. Wow, this is the Obi-Wan of the Bond world. Some of the best moments, individual moments, surrounded by a fucking mess of a film. I remember liking this one more, but the microscope does not do this movie any favors. C minus. C minus. I'm going to give this movie a B. A flat B. And now, going into this, when we first proposed this idea, this is my favorite James Bond movie of all time. Now, after putting it in my rankings, I don't know if it's necessarily my favorite James Bond movie of all time. You Only Live Twice was way better. You Only Live Twice was better. I'm sorry if you guys can't, if whoever's listening to this has a hard time with that hard to swallow pill, but it's a fact. It's a fact. I love this movie. I always have. But it has some flaws. And You Only Live Twice was a better movie. So, the kill count. How many do you think Bond kills in this movie? I'm gonna say Bond killed about 15 people. Five. Only five? Bond confirmed kills five. 37 are killed by others for a total of 42 on the official Bond kill count. Mm, seemed like he killed more people, but I guess he just knocked a bunch out. This movie had a kind of A-team thing to it where they didn't want to kill people and they kept showing them being okay after situations that, they sh that should have killed them. Kind of the opposite of Dr. No, where like the slightest thing would kill anybody. So, for the pre-title, I wrote, hated it. Yes, she was suicidal and walking into the ocean. I get that. But it just looked like Bond creeped out and flipped out when this woman he was stalking dipped her toes into the water. Then a terrible fight and a fourth wall break that I never liked. Sixth place. I am putting this into fifth place. Just above Dr. No and above Casino Royale. I know Dr. No did not 
really have a pre-title sequence. That's why it's so low, just above Casino Royale. Yeah. <laughs> well, the thing was, is even if it if those scenes that we count as its pre-title were actually a pre-title sequence in Doctor No, it would rank a lot higher. It would, but it wasn't a pre-title for the title or the theme. I gave this a a solid third place, just yeah. below Thunderball and Goldfinger. Why? Because you thought it was a bloody mess. Yeah, but not as much of a mess as the other one. <laughs> for me, it was okay. Themes that will be brought back for No Time to Die for a moment in the beginning, before giving way to a previously on slideshow. But a good song, fourth place. Money Penny pickup line. What would I do without you? You never do anything with me. It's not the best pickup line, but it's the best back and forth banter so far. Minus points for squeezing her ass, third place. I didn't give him minus points for squeezing the ass, and I did think the banter was better than all the other. So this is actually first place for me over the top of the films for the Money Penny Flirt. Q Gadgets. Radioactive pocket lint? Question mark? Fifth place. I also have put this in fifth place, because there was no Q in Dr. No and Casino Royal don't count. It's as low as you can go. Radioactive pocket lint. Yeah, yeah. Cars. And 19... 19- 68, Aston Martin, DBS. No gadgets or anything, just driven a lot. Third place. I'm putting it over the beat-up DB5 and the rental car from Thunderball since he never actually drove the DB5 in Thunderball. They just sprayed water from it and started the titles. I put it in third place just behind Goldfinger and Thunderball. Main ally, Mark Ange Draco. Another attempt to capture Karim Bay, but even more shady, and punches out his own daughter. He's smooth, but a dick. and helps out, but he's barely in the film. Fifth place, he does not beat Quarrel. I'm afraid I put him in third place. Damn, you liked him more. Because he does beat Quarrel. He, I do, I liked him more than Quarrel. I mean, I like Quarrel, don't get me wrong, but Quarrel was... He's an ally, but he was a henchman ally. Fucking Tiger, Karimbe, and Draco, all those dudes were bosses. Just saying, he belongs in the boss category. Oh, dang. That's sad. He's the bo- just did he, to he, right there. He, he's the bottom of the boss category, but but he's in the boss category. Now, don't get me wrong. Quarrel's a great ally. Loyal, trustworthy, afraid of dragons. <laughs> 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 but he's not on the boss level. Villains. Ernst. Stavra. Blofeld. Again. But done better this time. The actor knew how to play the strengths of the character better than Pleasance did. And first place, need I say more? You don't need to say more. Telly Savalas Blofeld, definitely first place. First place. If you're going to be Blofeld, be Telly Savalas Blofeld. Yeah, it's going to be hard to beat this guy. Main Hinch, Irma Blunt, an overweight attempt to do Rosa Kleb again without the gravity and power. She doesn't do much, she A-team survives an explosion twice as her stunt double was the one too close and engulfed in the second explosion. She does murder Bond's only wife, though, so negative brownie points for her, which is good, I guess, because <laughs> she's a bad guy. I- I'm just saying third place. I also put her in third place because she was more effective than Le Chief, but not more effective than Red Grant or Oddjob. But not so. very effective. <laughs> right. I mean, but she did kill Tracy, so. But she did kill Tracy. Bond girl, Contessa Teresa Di Vincenzo, or later Tracy Bond. She doesn't do much, she's incredibly emo, she's a damsel in distress, and yet she's played by Diana Rick. Second place. Ooh, second place. Uh, I put her in third place, because she doesn't do much. But she's so hot. Domino and Tanya both do more for James Bond, I I feel, than Tracy did, other than die. She is still the hottest of the Bond girls for me so far, and that does come into play when rating a Bond girl. I suppose. I might have to rate Denise Richards a little higher. Yeah, but she's also Denise Richards playing a nuclear physicist. It doesn't matter how hot you are. Right, right. It's just not believable. (laughs) It's the most unbelievable thing ever. (laughs) So, one-liner. I wrote, He had lots of guts. Definitely my favorite of the film. In fact, new number one. Oh, new number one? Uh, It's definitely my favorite of the films, but I like the one-liners in Goldfinger and Thunderball better. They were just 
more on point. So number three for you, eh? Yeah, number three for me, yeah. Locations, and you know how I do this. Portugal and Switzerland. Lisbon and Bern. I couldn't mark it better than YOLO. All right, so second. Second, yeah, okay. yeah. They used each location effectively without beating you over the head mm -hmm. with its blunt oversaturation of culture, i.e. Thunderball in the parade. It does feel like we get screwed a little on the Swiss locations until the back-to-back -back chase sequences and the avalanche bit. Yeah. Which, wow, on the avalanche. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Second, second place. Second place. You Only Live Twice, it not only showed off exactly the best parts of their locations mm -hmm. and the culture and how to use them, but they did it with the people who knew which parts and what culture to show off, and it right. just ended up being better and more memorable. Yeah. Projected attempt to kill Bond. Blofeld tells all to Bond, then traps him in a lift room to deal with later, which, of course, he escapes. Fourth place. Barely better than last time. Um, I put this in fifth place because I still think the trying to crash a plane, I guess, is better than locking him in an elevator room. That's not a protracted, that's an active attempt to kill Bond. It, it's still better, I don't know. It just didn't seem like there was a protracted attempt to kill him at all in this movie. They were all protracted attempts to kill Bond. Him literally shooting everything but him. Yeah, I know, I know. Mission or plot. A bait-and-switch medical study makes regular citizens into hypno-sleeper cells that can eradicate life with viruses that are then used as bargaining chips for a pardon and a title of count. Uh, I put this in second place. Still a better plot than trying to irradiate all the money. Not quite as good as the Thunderwell plot. It, it's really close. Really close. I put fifth place. Only Dr. No's plan made less sense to me. I've got this new technology that'll help me control and ruin the economy. Actually, it's I've got this tailor-made virus, and I'm putting it in all these girls for money. Actually, I, I, I really just want immunity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and to be made a count. Yeah. This movie's... No. I'm not giving that. I'm the fifth place on the mission for me. Stunts. I put this in fourth place. Wow. Well. They try. Yeah, they tried, right? They tried. And from Russia with Love, slightly better. They tried better with that. Yeah, and that's that's fair. Well, that fight scene on the train in From Russia with Love was actually right, well choreographed. Right, right. And, right and exactly. That's why this planned. goes in the fourth place. Because, you know, Goldfinger, they didn't really try. And Dr. No, they didn't. <laughs> Goldfinger, they did not try. There's not many stunts here, and most crazy stuff was dummies, or again, an accident. Right. Fourth place. The score. I put my score in fourth place. Overall, I like the synthy Bond theme overall. That's me. I like the synth. Oh, uh, see, there's the difference. Yeah, there's the difference. The best part of the music in this movie is when it didn't stick out like a sore thumb. Sixth place. Every effort by Barry is worse than the last, in my opinion. Movie. Overall, because I enjoy this movie and I, I dig the context of what they were trying to do, I understand that after watching it with a critical eye that they did not do what they were trying to do, but I get it. <laughs> so I put this movie in second place. Technically, Goldfinger was better, but I, I laud them for their experimentation with James Bond. So there you go. I honestly thought I was going to hate You Only Live Twice and love this, but sorry, younger me, the microscope has spoken, and this movie is a mess. A couple of epic moments, and Diana Rigg does not save this sinking ship. Sixth place. Mm. And, as they said, Bond will return for Diamonds Are Forever, and so will we. Until then, I'm Chris Carter. And I'm Agent Sedgwick. Stay spying. Y'all.